Well, good morning to you, and we welcome you again in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is our Master, our Lord. He's our mediator. Had it not been for Christ Jesus dying on the cross for us, where would we be today? Oh, praise God that he sent his only beloved son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for worms like ourselves, to pay the price, the penalty. Jesus was guiltless. We were the guilty, but he willingly offered his body. He willingly offered his spirit. He would offer it. He he offered all that he had on that cross, and he paid that price for our sins. May we never forget that. May we never forget the passion and the pain and the suffering and the humiliation of our Lord Jesus Christ on that cross. But the symbol of Christianity is the open, empty tomb. Hallelujah. God has vindicated Jesus Christ. God has reversed the verdict on Jesus Christ. God has coronated and glorified Jesus Christ. And that is who we serve. That is who we love. And that is who we are eagerly awaiting to return. This world is just a veil of nonsense and suffering and woes and confusion. And yet we find the truth. We find the true meaning of life in the Holy Bible. I hope and pray that you are investing your time, you are investing your energy in reading the Word of God. Yes, it's nice to have a great pastor. Yes, it's nice to have a nice church. Yes, there's some good preachers on social media. But you got to take the book. You got to take the book, this volume, this library, poetry and science and history and song and prophecy. And read it for yourself. And you'll be amazed. You'll be completely amazed to hear that gentle, soft whisper speaking to your heart, speaking to your soul. That's the voice of Jesus. That's the voice of Jesus speaking to you and saying, Come unto me, all you who labor, all of you who are that are just exhausted from this life. Aren't you just tired of the day in, day out stress of life? Jesus says, come, come to me. My yoke is easy. My light is, my burden is light. Why? Because he carries them for you. The secret to the Christian life is not trying to be reformed, not trying to change your life to become better, but dying to self carrying your cross, and letting Jesus live inside of you. That's the message of Christianity. It's so simple, and yet man continues to confound the grace of God by making the message of God way too complicated. I want to welcome you this morning. So many wonderful people are on board. We've got Martino. Martina, you're truly a man of God. I really appreciated our fellowship this week, and I'm looking forward to the things we're going to be doing together. Michael, God is with you, and God is going to take you straight to the top. Bishop Uda, can't thank you enough for riding shotgun with me. You are definitely a blessing from God. Jenny, I couldn't ask for a better thumb of my right hand. You're truly a blessing. Dr. Goldman, thank you for being a blessing to so many people. And today's message, and if you haven't had if you haven't had the opportunity, hint hint wink wink, you should be you should be subscribing. You should click that button. There's so many of you that haven't subscribed. Join. Come on. It's easy. You can do it. There you go. Click subscribe. There you go. You see that little bell? Click the notification bell. And share the link. My friend, we need to share the link. Share the word of God. It's so important. 
what better way to show your love to your family? What better way to show your love to a friend or to an employer by sharing the gospel, by sharing the word of God and say, I'm thinking of you today. Here's a link for you. And welcome Carl and Mark. And away we go. We have, we've got a time limit here. I know you don't have all day with me. I've had my coffee. Hope you're drinking yours. And today's topic, dun 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 dun, dun S E X. When was the last time you heard a pastor really talk about honestly unfiltered the word S E X? Think about it. It's a very important word. It's mentioned in the Bible. From Genesis to Revelation, it's mentioned. And yet we live in a generation of pastors that want to talk about parapsychology, about that they know the exact timing of when Jesus is going to return, who exactly is the Antichrist. Jesus says, do not be deceived. My friends, we need to be focused on four things. Reading the word of God, godly fellowship, breaking bread, and watching and praying. Those are the four basic elements. And the Bible says very clearly in, in, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, study, study, study. And prove and show yourself a workman approved by God. So many people want to become an accountant, a lawyer, a doctor, or whatever. They want to become successful. But if you want to be successful with God, if you want to be a partner with God, if you want to be a servant of the Lord, it's going to take time to study and prepare yourself. You think it's you think you think you, you, you do you think you get a black belt in a day? You think you get a black belt in a year? True martial arts, five years, five days a week training just to get a black belt. And a black belt means just, it's just the beginning. Black belt means nothing. Black belt means just, you just started your education. A black belt means you know what you know and, and you know what you don't know. And you're willing to have others be your mentor, but you also have to be a sensei for yourself and learn and teach yourself. My friends, I'm telling you, if you don't read the Word of God first thing in the morning, you're missing out on the most important and most, most exciting adventure of your life. I challenge you, wake up early, pour yourself a cup of coffee or tea or kombucha or whatever you drink, and just try reading the Word of God and give God, through the Holy Spirit, an opportunity to talk to you. So here we go. In 51 AD, this is Acts chapter 18, Paul now happens to be in a city, a Roman city called Corinthians. And there was a man named Titus, Titus Justus, who said, Paul, I know you're a righteous man, you're a prophet of God, you're an apostle, come stay at my house. And for the next year to almost year and a half, Paul dedicates his life speaking to the Corinthians. Now, the Corinthians were a mixture of Jews and Gentiles. It was a mixture of rich and poor. It was a town full of merchants. It had social diversity. It had cultural diversity. It happened to be the largest church that he was able to found. I guess you would consider it a mega church. On top of that, it was the richest church out of all the churches that he founded, remember, he, he would go and start a church, teach them, give them the doctrine of Christ, find a pastor, find an elder, get the church started, and then he would leave and go start another church. Out of all the churches, it had three main characteristics. One, it was the largest church. Two, it was the richest church financially, but it was also the richest church in spiritual gifts. I mean, this church had everything. The third, it was a messed up church. <laughs> you know, there was a time where my wife and I decided that we were not going to be in one church. I was a pastor of a Baptist church for a year, and I decided to become an itinerant preacher for several years. I wanted to understand what was going on and 
all the different churches that were going on in South Florida. It took me about a three, four year odyssey to, to visit all the churches, to, under, to, get a, to get a lay of the ground, and for me to understand that there's a lot of messed up churches. Now the people that are going to the church, it's not your fault. It's the pastor's fault because the pastor is not teaching sound doctrine. And I pray in the name of Jesus Christ that pastors would, would, would wake up, that America would wake up. It's still not too late. We're down to, listen, we are very deep down in the rabbit hole. May God have mercy on us. I don't know if, if, if America will make that U-turn, but it's never too late. It's never too late to call upon God. It's never too late to call upon God for mercy. We see this in the history of Israel so many times. They get so close to God and they're having a mountaintop experience. And then oftentimes they're in the gutter. They're in the sewer. And sometimes they reject God's mercy and they float down to the sewer. And sometimes at the very last moment they wake up and say, Lord, have mercy on us. We have sinned against you in heaven. Please have mercy on us. And God is a merciful God. But we have to be truly repentant. If America is going to wake up, if this world is going to wake up, it's going to have to really pay attention to what the New Testament has to say about sin. And we're going to talk about a topic that people are afraid to talk about, but I'm going to be raw, unfiltered, and I'm not fooling around. I'm going to just say it as it is. And I'll let the Lord take care of the rest. Now, in this church, I told you there was a lot of problems. It was a messed up church. And I'm going to read some verses to you. It's going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 to 20. I'm going to read them first to you. And then we're going to do some highlights. And then the rest is up to you. It's going to be your homework. It's going to be up to you to go back and read them and allow the Holy Spirit to guide you, uplift you, to encourage you, to inspire you, to motivate you to walk with the King. Amen. So here we go. Know you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? What a statement for Paul to say. Don't you understand that the unrighteous are not going to inherit the kingdom of God. He says, do not be deceived. Do not be deceived. He's echoing exactly what Jesus says. There's so many Christians today that are deceived. Listen to what he says. Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, that's people who practice sex outside of marriage, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor the effeminate. Oh, I wonder what that means. So many people are afraid to talk about that. The effeminate are not going to inherit the kingdom of God. Listen, I'm just I'm, I'm on his majesty's service. I'm the messenger. In Arabic, they call it the El Rasul. I'm the messenger. I'm the mailman. I'm the prophet. The effeminate are not going to inherit the kingdom of God, nor the abusers. Wow, Paul just lays it, I mean, Paul just digs it right in. Nor abusers of themselves with mankind. You know what I'm talking about. I don't have to spell it out for you. Nor thieves, nor covetous. If you're someone that is jealous of other people, my friend, jealousy is a horrible sin. I want what they have. I want that person's wife. I want that person's car. I want to have something better than that other person has. Do not be covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers. You know what reviler means? A slanderer. People who live on gossip. God doesn't like that. And those kind of people do not inherit the kingdom of God. Nor extortioners. The real word in Greek is swindlers. Oh, Mr. Politicians. Oh, Mr. Politicians out there. You're, you're supposed to be the servant of the public, a public servant, not a swindler. May God open your eyes. Shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But look, you know, Paul is writing this letter to the Corinthians, and it's so amazing. If you read 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and he opens the letter to them, 
He's not angry. He's not yelling at them. He, he openly shares with them lovingly. He says to them, you've been called by God. God loves you. God has given you plenty of gifts. God is going to be faithful to help you continue moving forward. And he's not hitting them on the head. You know, sometimes when we're doing the right thing and we see others are going the wrong way, you know, criticism, criticism doesn't always solve the problem. Sometimes we need to really get underneath and help lift that person so they can be enlightened. He says in verse 11 that you have been washed, sanctified, and justified in the name of the Lord and by the Spirit of God. You know, last night I was preaching to India to over 135 pastors. We were doing a leadership conference of how to become a better pastor. And we were talking about how many pastors are not justified. They're not even saved. They're pastors of churches and they don't know Jesus. My friends, look up the word justified, what it means. You can't try to live a life that's sanctified, that's holy to God, unless you're justified with God. Romans chapter 8. Now, he says something very interesting. Verse 12 says, all things are lawful unto me. All things are lawful unto me, but not all things are, are expedient. Not all things are beneficial. He says, look, if I want to have a glass of wine, there's no law against that. But if someone is around me who has a problem with alcohol, I should not be drinking that glass of wine. So not all things are beneficial. You see what Paul is saying? Don't live in the law. Don't live by the Old Testament. Live in the New Covenant. Very quickly here, there's three kinds of churches. There's one church that they know Jesus, they love Jesus, they know his voice, they have the Holy Spirit, and they're walking in the Holy Spirit by love. They're loving one another, they're loving God, and they're doing good works because they love God. That's the great church. And then you have the two opposites. You have the church that falls down and slides down the hill and starts to live by the law. Don't do this. Don't do that. Don't go there. Don't be this. Where were you last Sunday? You live by the law. And then in the other church, just like now the, the Corinthians, they find Christ and they slide down the other hill and they fall into license. They think they can do anything because, you know, I'm forgiven. I'm saved. Jesus paid for it on the cross. Jesus understands. He knows I, he knows I have a problem. He's already, been, he's already been paid for. And they don't realize that every time they keep sinning, they make Christ suffer on the cross all the more. And that's why Paul says, we should not sin. We should not abuse the grace of God. God forbid. Now, I'm going to go straight here to verse 15 to save time. Know you not that your bodies are the members of Christ? This body, this body that you have, is not yours. You know, so many people say, oh, my choice. I have a choice with my body. This is my body. Well, I mean, I have news for you. If you are a Christian, your body belongs to the Lord. And if you're not a Christian, your body belongs to the Lord anyway. It says here, know you not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? God forbid. Why is he saying this? Because in, in Corinthians, in the city there, they had a horrible problem with prostitution. There were so many temples of Aphrodite. And part of the, the worship there was to go in the temple and to have sex with these slaves. Part, and that was part of the worship they were having in the temples. Well, you may say to me, well, Dr. Sephora, that doesn't happen today. Are you kidding me? Turn on cable television. Cable television is the, is the present-day temple of Aphrodite. Nothing. There's no commercial that's out there that doesn't have sex or violence. Sex and violence. There's, it's all over the place. You know, it's a very important study that was made about 20 years ago, and it's been reduplicated both in medicine and in psychiatry and psychology, and has been proven over and over again. If you watch pornography, 
The way our mind works, it's as if you committed the act yourself. Didn't Jesus say, the Bible says, thou shalt not commit murder, thou shalt not commit adultery. But Jesus says, if you think in your mind, if you consider adultery in your mind, you've committed it already. Do you understand that? Our thoughts are so important. What we see on television, the games we allow our children to play on electronics, the advertising of today is all geared by the system of the world, by the God of this world, to blind you, to confuse you, to pierce you, to grab you, to pull you down and keep you away from the Spirit of God. Verse 16 is very heavy. It's not easy for me to say this, so I hope you have your spiritual seatbelts on. He says in 16, what? There's two what's here, so I'm, we're going to, it's, it's, he's, he's really, this is a true exclamation point. He says, what? Know you not, he that is joined with the harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. Remember when I, when Isaac got married, his wife came from Haran. There was no wedding ceremony. He saw her. He fell in love with her. She saw him. His, his, Isaac's mom was dead. He was in mourning. And he took her to his tent, and the two became one. You know that every time a man sleeps with a woman, every time a woman sleeps with a man, they become one flesh. In God's eyes, they became married. Do you know how many times people do not understand that they are sinning against a holy God? We as pastors, we as men of God, we as Christians, godly parents, we need to warn our children of the horrible sin of fornication. Would you want to marry someone that's been married a thousand times? There are people that have been out there that have been sleeping around and, the, and, 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 and their eyes, well, I'm not married. I haven't gone to court. I haven't gone. I haven't gone. I have, there, was no, there was no ceremony. There's no certificate. Well, in God's eyes, you have committed fornication. And fornicators don't make it to heaven. Now, this is something that most preachers don't want to talk about. And I'm going to close on this point here. It says here, flee fornication. Flee. You see, there, there are some sins you can just go in and, and the Bible says, submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and the devil will flee from you. Remember, when Joseph was accosted by Potiphar's wife, what did he do? He ran away. This is one sin, my friend, fornication, sex, premarital sex, sex outside of marriage. It's such a powerful, fiery, it's really an almost un uncontrollable fire. The only way you can handle this, this has to be taught to children, this has to be taught and reinforced to teenagers, and yes, us adults need to make sure that we understand that we have to run away. We need to flee from fornication. Why? The Bible says it very, very clearly. Every other sin, if you steal, if you lie, those are sins that are outside the body. But when you commit fornication, you sin against your own body. You know that when you break the bread and break the wine unworthily in the church, you're going to get sick. You're going to have troubles. Many people in church have died because they have taken the Holy Communion. They have taken the, the body of Christ and the blood of Christ, which are symbols that, for us to remember his death and passion. And they didn't take time for confession. My friends, if you are committing fornication, you're sinning against your own body. Did you know that? Every other sin is outside the body. But when you sin, the sin of fornication, you're sinning against your own body, your own spirit, your own health. It is 
a self-inflicting sin. That's why Paul is spending a lot of time here focusing on the sin because the other sins are outside the body. Now, I will tell you right now that if you made a list of from one to 10 of the top things that motivate men and women, money, popularity, fame, glory, music, there are many things that motivate people. The number one thing is sex. And I'm, and I'm imploring everyone to understand verse 20. If you're a Christian, you've been bought with a price, not of gold, not of silver, been bought with the precious blood of Jesus. And you don't belong to yourself. You belong to the Lord. And your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. God lives inside of you. And we are to eat right. We are to exercise correctly. We are to sleep properly. We are to take care of our bodies because it belongs to the Lord. And more importantly, we are to have a sanctified mind, pure, holy, and our body should not be involved in any form of fornication. That means being very careful of the movies and the books and the games you play. I hope these words have been an encouragement to you. You know, sometimes I, I have to lay it in straight and I'm not gonna pull any punches, but that's the message for today. Tomorrow, don't miss it, tomorrow 8.30, it's gonna be a, a real, it's going to be a real blessing. So I pray that you pray for that message tomorrow and join us. And I just want to say one final thing. Thank you for allowing me to be your servant. I don't deserve to be the servant of God. And I don't deserve to be your servant. I'm a nobody who became somebody in Jesus. And I'm so thankful. I'm so deeply thankful for God's mercy, for God's grace and for him allowing me to be his servant. So blessing and miracles and health and prosperity are coming your way in Jesus' name. Walk with the king.